Intel's 8380 Xeons are so fast for storage that basically all the software is broken. I had so many weird problems. Initially, I had trouble matching the performance that I was seeing on AMD Epic because that was the first system I had available, but it wasn't actually the hardware, it was the software. So to catch you up on my other videos, in the beginning, there was Threadripper Pro, and I was chasing 15 million IOPS on a single socket, and I barely got there with Megadisk, uh, eventually. Uh, but I was using almost 100% of a 32 core CPU to do it, but I did it. Now, really, that video exposed how much software overhead there is when you're dealing with a storage system that's so fast. It took like 26, 28 NVMe to do that. There's a lot of overhead to try to make the IO safe and efficient. But assumptions about how to build that kind of software are out the window when you have really fast NVMe storage. Some of it was really fast, some of it was older NVMe. Enter the 11th gen Intel CPUs. This plucky little i5 11600K behind me has four Gen 4 PCIe lanes for storage right into the CPU. And it's even faster than the 11th Gen i7 and i9. Not a lot faster to be sure, but I think that's because the CPU is able to use more of its power budget for IO than its higher end counterparts. That modest little system can do more IOPS per core than any server or any other CPU that I have. And that's what you gotta keep in the back of your mind when we're talking about IOPS per core because more IOPS per core is good. And the IOPS per core on that initial Threadripper Pro system wasn't great, but that wasn't really the platform. That was more down to the Linux kernel. Remember I said that it's a software bottleneck and it kind of kind of flattens off. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Since the video's back then, Intel's also released the P5800X Optane, and I've got more than one. The fastest NVMe on the planet, that's the P5800X hands down. And artificially, the best case scenario for one of those drives is in the millions of IO operations per second. We did our initial Intel testing with those 8380 Xeons and P5800X Optanes, and depending on the workloads, that is the fastest system that you can buy right now for certain types of workloads. And as I hinted then, I had read this paper from Intel about how they achieved 80 million IOPS on a similar 8380 system, but with an array of like 20 something P5800X Optanes. 80 million, how did they do that? I mean, I read the paper, I understood it. Uh, the write-up left me scratching my head in a lot of ways. Well, it turns out the secret really is just down to software. And that's what I've been working on for two months. Well, I'm just a lowly computer janitor. I don't necessarily need 80 million IOPS with something that exotic. What can I actually hit? Okay, the first problem I ran into with the Intel Platinum Xeon 8380s and the P5800X was that these CPUs were so fast that it exposed to some kind of severe bug with XFS and MD admin, so all my testing ground to a halt. Then I found this uh, uh, GitHub post about people doing Chia plotting. It looked really similar to the symptoms I was experiencing. They're using XFS on an MD admin array, just like I was, and they're seeing a kernel panic. Now for me, the kernel panic is so severe on this platform that sometimes it would actually overwrite my BIOS so that these super micro motherboards, they would no longer post. Once or twice, it actually even hard locked the IPMI. Fortunately, I could reset the system, log into the IPMI, re-upload the BIOS through the IPMI, but it's pretty impressive to have that severe of a bug and also troubleshooting that was a vast black hole of time. Initially, I thought it was a problem with the 8380s or the overall Intel platform because I couldn't reproduce it on other platforms, but, wasn't actually the case. These Intel Isolate Xeons and the P5800X combined are such low latency that software developers have never experienced anything like that before. It's actually a software bug somewhere. And that is what it's like to be on the bleeding edge that you can cause these kinds of severe problems. The next vast black hole of time problem that I had was if I load the system down, the Intel system, I could reduce the total number of IO operations available to the system dramatically. So for example, if my hardware was capable of 2 million IOPS, but I ask it for 10 million IOPS, it should still deliver 2 million IOPS. But instead, what was happening was that as I approached and exceeded a certain number of IOPS, the total IOPS available on the whole system would go way down. At one point, the system was capable of 5 million IOPS with just eight cores handling that load. But if I requested 10 million IOPS on 16 cores, it would only actually manage a total of about 1 million IOPS across the whole system. The Optane drives are basically sitting idle. I experienced no other similar regression on other platforms that I tested. And upon hours and hours and hours of investigation, this is again down to the platform being so new. Between a newer version of the Linux kernel, 5.15 is 
just entered you know, development and a platform firmware update, that issue is basically resolved. Now I can still recreate it if I try, but that's a landmine in the sense that if you're just a user and you buy this and you just buy the hardware and you expect to be able to use it, you're gonna have a bad time because the performance regression is pretty severe. And keep in mind, I've got 80 cores to work with in this system. If all 80 cores are really thirsty for IO, the total IOPS across the whole system might actually go down to 150,000 when you're affected by the software bug, meaning that my P5800X, again, they're just sitting idle most of the time. That's a bug. What, what on earth is going on there? You should never regress that hard. Fortunately, if you do have to run an older kernel, there are actually a lot of options, even since 2017. Western Digital and Damien Lamole, I think is how you say his name, they have this amazing presentation from 2017 to talk about changes that were then coming. Well, they're here now, and they've been here a while. Uh, for one, these storage devices were so fast, then we don't really need interrupts. Interrupts get in the way. The performance of a P1500X is so consistent and so fast, you can just tell the CPU to come back in a, a limited short interval, and chances are the hardware will have completed the read or write request by then. In 2017, the fix for inter the overhead of interrupts was to just enable hybrid polling. That's great because the kernel could still use interrupts if something was taking a long time, just, yeah, just get back to me when you're done, or polling automatically, whatever was most appropriate for the device. It was on by default in some distros, and now it's kind of off by default in some distros, but it's pretty easy to check if it's on or off depending on what you're doing. You can just cat, sys, block, NVMe, uh, hopefully we're on zero, that's adaptive polling, minus one is just standard polling. I mean, but look at these Ice Lake Xeons. This is 2021, it's not 2017. Look how much different they are than Sky Lake and Cascade Lake, or even just from Sky Lake to Cascade Lake was not a huge difference. With these Ice Lake Xeons, everything is different. Everything is different and everything needs a little bit of software love because the software is lagging behind what the hardware is actually capable of in a lot of cases. It's all new. I mean, now back to 2017 for a second. With hybrid polling, the completion interrupt will still occur. It's just that the interrupt service routine or ISR that confirms nothing needs to be done, it'll still fire, but when it fires, it says, oh, everything's all done. I don't have to do anything. That still takes overhead though. And there's also the, the overhead of allocating the primitive in the Linux kernel for handling block IO or BIO. I mean, that's, that's all hit overhead too. Remember, SPDK does away with pretty much all of this. And that's a pretty dramatic change if you can change your app to work with SPDK's approach. Well, these names from 2017 are about to pop up again. Jen's Axbo, my hero, saves the day again with some killer patches for bleeding edge kernels, you know, 5.15 and beyond. First off, those legacy interrupts, forget them. We're only doing polling now and we're using hardware in the CPU to accelerate the IOs as much as possible. Kernel 5.15 has some major changes to even allow one to recycle those kernel block IO primitives for more than one IO operation. So you're not waiting on the kernel to give you a primitive to do the IO operation. So that's even less overhead. That's more of an overhead reduction. You see, as I've worked on this, I've gone through different IO engines, IOU ring mainly, but I've also worked through various regressions with that and tweaks and, and other IO engines. Also performance quirks because of deep changes that are coming down the pike and sort of a missynchronization in software. I mainly use FIO for all my IO testing. It's the venerable tool that everybody uses, the flexible IO tester. But even it is not super trustworthy right now because to take full advantage of all this new hardware and speed, it also needs some tweaks in addition to the changes that are in kernel 5.15. You gotta also make some changes to FIO. You may end up compiling your own because what's bundled with your distro is pretty old. Now step back for a second. That's the part you should be impressed with. That we've come so far, so fast, the bottleneck is now the time delta in the software. So long story short, and yeah, Pharonix did me, beat me to the punch here. Three million IOPS per core is now possible inside the Linux kernel. Three million IOPS per core. That is an unprecedented performance uplift, you know, generation on generation from software. It's not enough that we can hit 15 million IOPS on the 8380. We need to do it with as little CPU overhead as possible. And now with 5.15 and all the, all, all the bells and whistles, we're at about 10% CPU utilization, admittedly best case scenario on this 80 core system, at least 72 cores to do all the compute around this IO, but that's not all. Intel has open sourced SPDK, so it could show up elsewhere. You're thinking, 
okay, okay, what about this on Epic and Epic with the P1500X and SPDK on Epic? Well, that's gonna have to wait for another video. I can tell you it takes more cores on Epic to handle this much IO, even with all this cool stuff. And Epic would probably benefit from more cash. Maybe, probably, in this scenario, but that's not actually what I wanna talk about next. What I wanna talk about next is Windows Server 2022, which just dropped, and the performance there. You see, there's a lot of updates to Windows Server 2022 and storage spaces. I did some quick checking and, well, it's not great with storage spaces and parity disks and the performance there. The software overhead is so bad that even with just four Optane devices, I can leave pretty much all that performance on the table. Striping and mirroring is really about the only thing that works reasonably okay. Not great, but reasonably okay, in my opinion, with storage spaces. Parity disk or dual parity disk performance is still terrible and only about 20 or 30% of the performance even of like ZFS on Windows. There really isn't an excuse for ZFS on Windows being faster than storage spaces because ZFS on Windows is right now kind of an unholy abomination. Okay, enter StarWinds software. Starwinds people sort of noticed this, and they're putting SPDK on Windows. Look at this. Their test system is an ancient E5 2630 V4 running at 2.2 gigahertz, and it absolutely destroys storage spaces for performance. I, I know, I know, these aren't really meant to solve exactly the same problem, but since I've got this gear, this really amazing 8380, I really want to put their software to the test. The bottom line is that the storage spaces stuff in server 2022 still mostly only makes sense for a read-only environment. And the highest performance options, well, you're gonna have to look elsewhere. So big picture, step back and look at all this. The work for the last two months, I'm really skipping a lot here. SPDK has been five years in the making, but look how much we can gain on the hardware that's out right now today if we're willing to invest a lot of time in getting the software right. It's an uphill battle on both Linux and Windows, more so on Windows, to get the most out of a server storage subsystem. There is a ton of software overhead. On Linux with older kernels, hybrid polling is a nice you know, speed bump. On a bleeding edge kernel like 5.14, you can get an enormous performance bump. Three million IOPS per core is far and away better than anything else you can get on prior uh, Linux kernels. I mean, you're looking at about 1.5 best case scenario. And then you look at how far behind Windows Server 2022 is, or at least how far it still seems to be. Now, there's also other aspects of that. I, I did check and see how the scheduler does with AMD's older Threadripper 2990WX on Server 2022. Uh, spoiler, it's not great. And my testing does show that there is some improvement in some scenarios for large processor groups that had previously been misdetected as a separate NUMA node when they're not, but a lot of it is still really suboptimal. Maybe all of Microsoft's attention is actually focused on getting Alder Lake and Sapphire Rapid stuff working correctly with Intel's Thread Director. I don't know. I don't have access to that hardware yet. Time will tell. But for storage, it sure does look like Intel's SPDK is light years ahead of everything else, and SPDK with StarWinds stuff on Windows is so far ahead of what Microsoft has that Microsoft probably should just buy them and then integrate that into the Windows storage subsystem because the Windows platform seems that broken in terms of performance. At least when we're talking about the highest performance. And that's why I said all the software is pretty much broken. It's it's not just broken on Windows, it's a little bit broken on Linux, but it seems like Linux is a little bit ahead if you're willing to you know, live on the bleeding edge. And where, I, where did I land with just four Optane in this 80 core system? Well, 10 million IOPS is the best case scenario that I've been able to achieve without going too far off script. And that is seriously impressive performance for both Optane and Intel Ice Lake Xeon. And that's just what I can do with kernel 5.15 with all the new tunables. I didn't actually go the SPDK route. Now, if you're a performance junkie and you need to set up something like this for work, we should probably connect on the Level 1 Text Forum. It's a fairly involved setup, and I'm still not 100% sure that what I've done here is the best possible setup. But I am pretty happy that my CPU overhead's only about 10% and I can clear 10 million IOPS. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look, quick-ish look slash ramble at the uh, dual processor Xeon 8380. Why it's really awesome for low latency storage. Really, it's kind of in a class by itself when coupled with the P5800X Optane. And it also sort of uncovers that uh, <laughs> the rest of uh, the rest of us computer janitors have a lot of work to do to actually take advantage of it. I'm signing out. And you can find me in the level one forums.